Hello and welcome to the Grand Line Review, your source for everything One Piece. Today we have a manga review of chapter 935, Queen. And given the title of the chapter, I think it's only fitting to begin with the man himself, Queen. This chapter gave us some great moments with him, making him out to be a lot wackier than I thought he'd be, which I am a big fan of. In fact, my personal favorite moment from this chapter was definitely when he was being reported all of the things that were going wrong and he just had an increasingly over the top face fault reaction to every single one of them. The dancing certainly helped as well as did the singing. In fact, the line about him being too popular if he lost weight was a very good laugh. And Queen is just fantastic really, which is great because I was a afraid that we were in for a serious sadistic hulking mass of power. But no, once again, One Piece proves that even the strongest beings in the world can have a hilariously goofy side as well. Speaking of the whole strength thing though, I should probably address the matter of Queen's bounty, which is a mighty 1.32 billion berries. And I guess that's that's pretty damn high, isn't it? In fact, it's the third highest specifically revealed bounty in the series to date. Probably not something we should be taking lightly, and yet I can't help but do just that. The way Queen's bounty was revealed was pretty amazingly casual, actually, having occurred right after all the dancing and such. Sadly, the problem with that number being revealed is that it means that's all anybody online is really going to be talking about. I mean, I can already see it unleashing a floodgate of people who have their hearts set on Sanji versus Queen, contemplating how Sanji will possibly overcome him, even though I really don't think we should get too attached to that idea. Or how Queen is stronger than Katakuri, as well as people using Queen's bounty to directly speculate on King's bounty. And it's just blah, blah, blah. So I'm not going to do any of that, but I will say that I find it interesting that Kaido's top commanders are monetarily considered a much higher threat on mass than Big Mom's commanders. I mean, from a narrative perspective, yeah, it makes sense, because the only real way for Oda to effectively raise the stakes in Wano is to be facing off against people who have high arbitrary numbers assigned to them. But it's interesting to consider that the world government views the Beast Pirates as more of a threat than the Big Mom Pirates. At the same time, I guess that's also because they have nefarious plots to plunge the world into war, whereas Big Mom, you know, just wants a meal every now and then. And and by every now and then, I mean on like a bi-hourly basis, but still. In any case, Queen seems to have come up with a quote unquote exciting idea to punish Luffy and Hyogoro, but actually just on Hyogoro for a bit. This is the second chapter in a row where he's being really hyped up as a very important piece in this arc. And it was pretty much literally stated here that if the Alliance had him on their side, then they'd be able to recruit their army to fight Kaido, which were essentially my thoughts on him after the last chapter, but we're getting serious now. And I really liked how Oda portrayed him both visually and through the legend of his character. In terms of design, obviously the first thing I thought of was Snake Man because they have well similar inspirations, but Hyogoro looks like one hell of a boss. I would have loved to have seen him fighting in his prime. And you know what? I actually don't see why we wouldn't be able to see just that when the eventual Wano flashback rolls along. I also really like the idea of Yakuza working for the good of the people rather than our modern day definition. The thing is though, it's probably not going to be an easy task for Hyogoro to prove that he is in fact Hyogoro because of his radical visual changes. I mean, the prisoners were staring at disbelief even when his name was said aloud by Queen. So it'll probably be up to an old face that recognizes him, maybe Shutenmaru or someone along those lines. On the topic of familiar faces though, there's a guy in the prison who still actually has no face, but he has been officially revealed to be Kawamatsu. So yeah, as predicted, he is one of the samurai we've been looking for. And because it was so obvious, I kind of question ending the chapter on that note. It's just not the most exciting of cliffhangers. It may have actually been better served if it was slightly earlier and Queen's statement about coming up with an exciting idea was the vinyl panel, but meh. Another thing that was but meh was the segment of the chapter with Frankie Law and Usopp talking with Yasu in Ibisu village. But apart from one intriguing mention of Zoro, it was pretty much just a glorified transition into the bathhouse section. I don't often feel this way with One Piece, but you could probably remove that page and there would be no real impact on the chapter, apart from a hard cut to the bathhouse, which wouldn't be so bad because we hard cut to scenes all the time. And as for the bathhouse, we spent a surprising amount of time here, like four whole pages. And I, I have mixed feelings about it. The problem is like I feared, nothing really happened. It was just where the discussion about Hyogoro took place, but the location itself was not integral to that. So I can't help but feel like, you know, it was titties for the sake of titties, which hey, there's an audience for. That audience just isn't me so much. If I want that, there's this wonderful tool called the internet. But for One Piece, I really want the story to continue, especially after a week's break. Like so much of that four page sequence was more or less pointless. Like the explanation of the octopus bathhouse attendants or the entire introductory page setting up the location and you know, repeating that devil fruit users shouldn't submerge themselves. I don't know, as aesthetically appealing as it is, I can't help but feel a lot of effort was 
put into this for very little gain. It really makes me wonder if it was Oda who was so passionate about inserting a bathhouse moment into the arc, or if it was advice from an editor or something. I mean, it wouldn't be out of character for Oda to do such thing, but come to think of it, quite a few arcs have a moment like this with Nami or Robin or both bathing, and it feels really out of place like on Thriller Bark. In any case, whatever, it happened, although I suppose there's every chance it's not even over yet, because Sanji's entire goal right now seems to be the bathhouse, so uh, maybe these four pages, yeah, aren't the end. I tell you what though, if Oda pulls out a serious plot point that could have only happened in the bathhouse, I'll gladly eat my words. But if not, then let's be real, we're kind of wasting our time here. But overall, this was still a pretty great chapter. Some very nice character work with Queen and Hyogoro, and some satisfying plot progression in the Prisoner Mine as a whole. Definitely not one of my favorite chapters so far in Wano, but I really like what we're building towards. And that pretty much does it for chapter 935. If you enjoyed this video and the content this channel produces in general, then please do consider donating to the Grand Line Review Patreon, because the support of all of you amazing people is what continues to make this channel possible. Also, do check out my Teespring store if you're interested in shirts, hoodies, and other miscellaneous items, with the proceeds going directly to support the channel as well. And if you'd like to join the fun at any time, then please do head over to my Discord server, where a wide array of shenaniganry takes place on a daily basis. And finally, please do comment with your thoughts on the chapter. This has been the Grand Line Review, and I'll see you next time.